One minute, the California coast is calm. The next, 60-foot waves tear apart piers and flood towns from San Diego to Seattle, without a single storm to explain them. Three people are missing. Authorities are evacuating thousands as a 1,300-mile wall of water arrives, synchronized to the minute. Scientists are out of answers, warnings are spreading, and nobody agrees on what's coming next. But what unleashed this unprecedented assault? And could something even worse be building beneath the Pacific? Water surges over the Santa Cruz Harbor Wall, swallowing the parking lot in seconds. Sirens wail as the harbor master scrambles to radio a warning. Another wave is already building beyond the breakwater. Along the wharf, planks shudder and crack. A fisherman drops his tackle and runs, boots slipping on soaked boards, as a wall of white water slams the pier. The structure groans, then a section gives way, splintering into the foam. Salt spray blinds first responders rushing to help, but the water is faster. In Pacifica, witnesses shout and point as a lifeguard tower vanishes beneath a rolling surge. Cell phones capture the chaos. Cars float sideways down Beach Boulevard, a family clutching a street sign as the current tears at their feet. The air is thick with the sound of shattering glass and distant alarms. Emergency crews fight to keep order. The harbor master, voice hoarse over the radio, calls for immediate evacuation of the lower marina. Residents pile into trucks, headlights flickering through spray as police tape off flooded intersections. The coast highway is blocked by debris, picnic tables, driftwood, even a battered ice chest tumbling end over end. In Half Moon Bay, a Coast Guard rescue boat struggles against the current, searching for three people swept from the pier. Their names echo over the scanner, but there's no sign of them in the churning water. By mid-morning, the list of missing grows. Local officials urge everyone to stay away from the shoreline, but some can't resist the spectacle. A group gathers on a bluff above Monterey Bay, watching as another set of waves overtops the dunes and pours into beachside homes. Inside the Santa Cruz Harbor office, the harbor master stares at the tide chart, hands shaking. The numbers make no sense. The swells are higher and faster than anything on record, and the water keeps coming, every 17 minutes another set, each one bigger than the last. Reports flood in from up and down the coast, piers torn loose in Bodega Bay, flooded streets in Seaside, a restaurant in Morro Bay ripped from its pilings and carried out to sea. For thousands, evacuation is no longer a choice. It's a matter of survival. The only question now is what could possibly drive the ocean to attack with such force? and why no one saw it coming. At 7.14 in the morning, emergency dispatchers in San Diego log the first coastal surge call. Water is breaching the seawall near Ocean Beach, flooding parking lots and pushing sand into the streets. Just eight minutes later, lifeguards in Huntington Beach report a wave set overtopping the pier, scattering surfers and sending tourists scrambling for higher ground. The timeline repeats itself up the coast, by 7.30 in the morning, Ventura County issues a flash warning as the marina's docks begin to break loose. At 7.41 in the morning, a sensor at Pillar Point Harbor, just south of San Francisco, records a sharp spike in water level. The same minute, a Coast Guard station in Astoria, Oregon, transmits an urgent bulletin. Unusual wave activity, multiple sets, flooding, expected. From San Diego to Seattle, more than 1,000 miles of shoreline are hit within the same hour. Local emergency operation centers from Los Angeles to Portland activate their coastal response protocols nearly in unison. In Westport, Washington, city officials close the main beach access as waves crash over the dunes and sweep driftwood into the parking lot. Meanwhile, in Pacific City, Oregon, the Volunteer Fire Department races to close a low-lying road as water surges across the asphalt, carrying picnic tables and trash bins toward the river mouth. At each location, timestamps from security cameras, tide gauges, and cell phone videos align with uncanny precision. The surges arrive in synchronized sets, each about 17 minutes apart, 
hammering the coast with mechanical regularity that defies the usual chaos of winter surf. NOAA's buoy network confirms the pattern. Offshore instruments ping in sequence as the wave energy moves north and south, not as a single wall, but as a rolling coordinated front. Charts from the National Data Buoy Center show spikes in wave height and period at stations hundreds of miles apart, all logged within minutes of each other. Meteorologists and oceanographers trading messages across state lines realize this is not a patchwork of local incidents. The same hour data from San Diego, Monterey, Crescent City, Newport, and Grays Harbor point to a single continent scale event. No previous storm or earthquake has produced this kind of geographical lockstep. Regional emergency managers, accustomed to dealing with isolated winter hazards, find themselves coordinating across three states. Conference calls between the California Office of Emergency Services Oregon's Office of Emergency Management, and Washington's Emergency Management Division run non-stop. The question on every line is simple. What force could unleash such uniform violence across 1,300 miles of coast? Local officials scramble to share resources as reports of damage, flooding, and stranded residents pour in from nearly every coastal county. The search for answers is no longer confined to a single harbor or town. The entire West Coast is now on alert, and the mystery has grown from a local disaster to a continental enigma. Out in the Pacific, a silent network of instruments keeps constant watch. The NOAA buoy array, stretching from Point Loma to Cape Flattery, begins to relay readings that do not fit the usual winter surf. Station 46026 off San Francisco records a rapid spike wave heights exceeding 50 feet, with dominant periods locked at exactly 17 minutes. The pattern repeats at Station 46029 near the Columbia River and Station 46041 off Monterey Bay, each buoy pinging in sequence as the energy moves along the coast. The data streams into the National Data Buoy Center, where analysts see not just size, but a strange regularity. Wave intervals are so precise they trip automated alerts in the system. High resolution mode kicks in without human intervention, capturing every crest and trough at one second intervals. It is not just surface waves. Deep ocean dart stations designed to sense tsunamis register subtle but sustained pressure changes on the seafloor. The bottom pressure recorders, sensitive enough to detect a single centimeter shift in water column height, show synchronized pulses matching the 17-minute surface rhythm. These instruments are built to filter out normal storm noise, but now their algorithms flag the signals as outliers, pushing the raw data to NOAA and the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center for immediate review. Across the network, maintenance logs confirm the sensors are working as designed. No biofouling, no recent firmware glitches, no clock drift the instruments themselves become the story. For the first time in decades, the entire West Coast buoy array is in high alert mode, feeding a continuous stream of anomalous data to every major forecasting office. The numbers are irrefutable, and they all point to the same question. What is injecting this much energy into the ocean? And why does it move with such precision? The search for a source begins. But the instruments offer only one certainty. This is no rumor, no illusion. The ocean is delivering a message in code, and every sensor is ringing the alarm. Satellite operators scan the Pacific, searching for any sign of a brewing storm. Nothing. The imagery from every pass goes west, Himawari. Even the European Sentinel satellites shows a vast cloudless ocean. No low pressure system, no squall lines, not even a dense fog bank. Yet the waves keep coming, each set arriving with a precision that defies explanation. Every 17 minutes, like clockwork, the next surge slams the coast. Meteorologists used to reading the language of storms find only silence in the data. Barometric pressure is steady, 
wind readings are normal. Onshore, the sky stays blue, the air eerily calm. At the National Weather Service's Bay Area office, forecasters double-check their models. The Pacific should be quiet. The only disturbances are thousands of miles away, too distant to send waves of this size and frequency. The ocean, however, is not following the rules. Each wave set matches the last, height, period, direction, all within a narrow range. It is as if the ocean is being driven by an unseen metronome, not the chaos of wind and weather. Calls flood in from research vessels and coastal radar stations. Surface current maps show ripples of energy moving toward shore, but none of the usual signatures of a storm generated swell. Satellite altimetry confirms the, sur confirms the surface anomaly, a broad, low-frequency pulse, invisible to the naked eye marching eastward. The regularity is unnerving. 17 minutes between crests measured from San Diego to Seattle. With every new data point, the mystery deepens. The waves are real, the damage undeniable, but the sky above remains clear and empty. The usual suspects, storms, squalls, distant typhoons are nowhere to be found. Something else is stirring the Pacific and every instrument agrees it is not coming from above. Long before satellites or seismic networks, the people of the Pacific Northwest watched the ocean for signs. The Quinault and Maka nations tell of a night when the land shook and the sea vanished, only to return as a wall of water that swept away entire villages. Their stories, passed down for generations, describe the ground rumbling animals fleeing, and a silence before the roar. In the winter of 1700, tree rings along the coast captured the moment. Groves of ancient cedars drowned by sudden salt water, their growth stunted in the same year. Across the Pacific, Japanese scribes recorded an orphan tsunami striking without warning. No earthquake was felt in Japan, but the waves arrived just after midnight, flooding rice paddies and fishing towns. It took centuries to connect these records. Scientists now agree. A magnitude 9 earthquake ripped open the Cascadia subduction zone on January 26, 1700. The waves that followed reshaped coastlines and erased entire communities. Today, those same fault lines lie locked beneath the sea, silent but loaded with strain. Geologists pore over marsh sediments and ghost forests, searching for the fingerprints of past tsunamis. Every layer tells a story of sudden inundation, of forests drowned and fields buried under sand. The recurrence interval, the average time between these catastrophic events, hovers between 200 and 530 years. With 325 years since the last rupture, Anxiety grows in coastal towns from Northern California to Vancouver Island. Inside the USGS Earthquake Monitoring Center, a new protocol flashes on the alert desk. For the first time, the Cascadia Early Warning System shifts to elevated status. This is not a routine test. Emergency planners review evacuation maps as sirens stand ready. The memory of 1700 is no longer distant legend. It is a warning, etched in the land, the trees, and the stories of those who survived. As the waves hammer the coast, the past and present collide, and the question hangs in the air, is history about to repeat itself? 200 miles offshore, the ocean floor tells a different story. On board the research vessel, Dr. Elena Kwan peers at a live feed from a remotely operated vehicle as it drifts over a raw, jagged scar slicing through the seabed. Plumes of sediment billow upward, clouding the water in dense, shifting curtains. The remotely operated vehicle's sonar maps a slope collapse the length of a football field. Fresh, angular debris is scattered across the canyon floor, with no sign of the usual deep-sea life. Instruments measure turbidity levels spiking far above baseline, suggesting a massive volume of mud and sand has only recently been set loose. Dr. Kwan's voice crackles through the ship's intercom. She says, 
We are seeing evidence of a very recent slope failure. The sediment here is still in motion. High resolution bathymetric scans show a gouge running down slope, its edges sharp and unweathered, tracing the path of a sudden, violent landslide. The scale is staggering. Enough displaced earth to fill city blocks is funneled toward the deep. While surface conditions remain deceptively calm, the seafloor bears the scars of upheaval, hinting at a hidden force powerful enough to send shockwaves through the water column. A faint vibration travels through the ground, barely noticeable at first. In a darkened lab at the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network, Dr. Jason Lee studies a spectral graph on his monitor. The data shows a persistent low-frequency tremor, an energy band that does not match the sharp spikes of an ordinary earthquake. The signal pulses beneath the Pacific, steady and unbroken, as if the Earth itself is straining. At the same time, along the beaches north of Mendocino, marine biologist Dr. Aisha Morales logs a series of urgent calls. Dozens of deep-sea fish, never seen this close to shore, lie stranded on the sand. Further south, a pod of gray whales, normally bound for Baja, turns abruptly west, swimming away from the coast. Dr. Morales flips through her field notes. Last week, the whale's acoustic tags showed restlessness, long before the first wave hit. Stranding logs fill with unfamiliar species, sablefish, ragged tooth grenadiers, even a giant squid washed up near Newport. For both scientists, the clues are piling up. The land shudders with a silent warning, while the ocean's creatures flee from something they sense before any instrument can confirm it. Inside FEMA's operations center, officials study live feeds and emergency bulletins, careful not to use the word tsunami in any public statement. The language stays clinical, coastal hazard, Unusual wave action. Behind closed doors, the agency activates protocols reserved for only the most unpredictable threats. USGS convenes a special task force, but their press briefings offer only measured uncertainty. No one claims to know what is coming next. Scientists split into camps, each theory more unsettling than the last. Some warn that methane hydrates locked beneath the ocean floor could be destabilizing as temperatures rise, releasing gas, shifting sediment, and triggering underwater landslides. Others argue for a hidden pulse of volcanic activity pointing to subtle temperature changes and unexplained tremors. A small but vocal group insists the pattern matches only one thing, the early stages of a megathrust earthquake, the kind that last struck in 1700 and could occur again without warning. A leaked memo from an anonymous industry engineer surfaces online. The document, dated two weeks before the first wave hit, details abnormal readings from undersea fiber optic cables, pressure spikes, and unexplained vibrations flagged by offshore drilling monitors but never reported to federal authorities. The memo ends with a blunt recommendation. Recommend immediate review by independent hazard team. Potential for significant geophysical event cannot be ruled out. Despite mounting evidence, no peer-reviewed study offers a definitive explanation. The waves continue, the warnings grow more urgent, and the official silence grows heavier. For now, the only certainty is uncertainty and the uneasy sense that the true cause remains hidden beneath the surface. Today, Real West Coast wave threats come not from the unknown, but from rising seas, intensifying storms, and aging infrastructure, risks NOAA and the U.S. Geological Survey monitor relentlessly. As climate shifts accelerate, the true alarm is how prepared we are for what is already possible. Nature does not wait for certainty. The next warning may not come with a headline, only a tide. Share your thoughts below.